So if you have a need or someone you know needs prayer, that's a great way to reach out and get that prayer you need. The second one is our expression of commerce part. That's like a news feed. So if we have any updates to um, service times or upcoming events, it'll be on that page. We also want to let you know that this is a tobacco free campus, so just make sure you follow that in the park. And along with that, remember it's water only in the sanctuary, just keep things neat. Once again, we just want to say welcome. Actually, welcome home. We're so glad that you're here. We would love to meet you. Just stop by and chat with us after service. And now, if you would. How are you, church? I'd like to welcome you to the house this morning, to Expression Church. Who's glad they came? Good to hear. I want to kick things off this morning by reading to you a brief passage out of Ephesians chapter 2. It says, But God, who's rich in mercy, because of His great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, He made us alive together with Christ and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That in the ages to come, He might show the exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. One thing we need to understand this morning is that means now. It's not something coming down the road. It's not this age to come. It's not something that we eternally just sit at a bus stop waiting to arrive. But we have this recognition, this revelation in our inner man that the age to come means right now. That God's purpose for our lives in this room this morning is to show His exceeding great kindness and grace toward each and every person in this room. No matter what our situation might be, no matter what circumstance, what we face, what, what triumph, what hilltop or valley we are walking through. Father, I just thank You that in this room we can be vessels, Lord God, that You pour Your grace and mercy through each and every life. And Father, as we just lift our hands in this room and extend that love to the person on our left, the person on our right, Father, I thank You. We are vessels ministering the goodness and greatness of our God. Father, we just thank You, Lord. There is victory in this room this morning. There is Your glory in this room this morning. Hallelujah, Lord God. Come on, Church, let's lift him up. Let's praise our God in this place. I'm marching to battle, no doubt in my mind that my God is with me and victory is mine. I'll dance in the shadow of my enemy because God is my champion and he fights for me. Oh, God is my champion and he fights for me. Prosper 
victory that we have in him. Yes. Because through him we're not afraid. Come on, let's declare that together today. Sing, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Tell every giant, get out my way. Sing it again, say. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Tell every giant, get out my way. Sing it out, say. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Tell every giant, get out my way. I'm not afraid. celebrating baptisms this morning. Yeah. I'm not forsaken, never alone. The God of heaven calls me his own. He's not just seated upon the throne. I know he's right here inside this home. I'm not a treasure here in my heart. And in my weakness, it won't depart. I have a Savior who will abide. He's not just with me, He lives inside. Just go as Daniel lives, our God will bring you out, and He will testify. He shuts the lion's mouth. Go as those Hebrew boys, if He sticks by your side, they will identify. The fourth man in the fire, they'll tell you
Come on, worship the King of Kings today.
Jesus. The name of Jesus. Come on. That's exactly, that's exactly what I'm about to tell him. When I say the name of Jesus, Jesus, how many just immediately feel that raise up on the inside of you there? What we were just witnessing just a moment there in the tank is not someone that's trying to conform to standards around them, but those of us that got to be close to those baptisms, it's very plain to see that they're responding to something that's coming up from within them. They have the choice to do that. It's amazing that God of this universe, the creator of all things, stirs up on the inside of you and you still get to choose on whether you're going to respond to it. The name of Jesus is above every name and your heart knows it. Your heart knows it. Why do you guys lift your hands? Why do you, why do you go to the altar and pray and cry and, and, and seek after one another? Why do you love each other the way that you do? Is because the name of Jesus stirs something deep inside of you. And you're answering that call this morning. The scripture says today when you hear his voice I want you to listen when you hear his voice don't be like those that that just kind of determined to go their own way in the wilderness and and stubbornly push through life when and ignore that answer on the inside of them but instead when you feel that answer whatever that looks like answer answer I plead with you by the By the name of Jesus today, answer that call. Some of you, he's moving you to give your whole heart and mind to him in a way that you never have before. And I want you to know that though the service has a structure, it does not have any confines. And if you need to get in this tank, you need to come to me. You need to answer. You need to answer. Some of you have been walking a walk with God that's comfortable and the Lord has been, you all the while, you've got this nagging thing on the inside that says, I've got an answer, a greater call on my life. I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I've got to find some way to answer. This is for you this morning. What we told them is when the Lord begins to bubble up on the inside of you, you just give voice to it and don't you worry about what it sounds like, what it feels like, what it acts like. You trust the Holy Spirit and his leadership instead of you. How about you do the same thing this morning? Father over every person right now, I just take this pause so that your Holy Spirit can have his way. All over this room, Lord, you're calling to people. Come on in. Come on in to the fullness of what I have planned for you. Somebody needs to hear this. I'm not through with you yet. I'm not through with you yet. In the middle of the stuff that have overwhelmed you, the stuff that has taken your heart and it has taken your focus, the Lord says, I have not quit You may feel like you've quit, but as long as I'm beating on the inside of you, you have not quit. And I'm asking you now to come on in. Come on in. Father, we want to answer that call this morning with our whole heart's mind. In Jesus' name. Somebody say amen. Amen. I'm far from innocent 
the shackles I wear I bought on my own Scarlet sins had a crimson cause Nail my death to that old rugged cross An empty slave at the empty grave Thank God that stone was rolled away Lord, I confess And I've been prodigal for your house But I walked my own road Then Jesus came And he tore down my prison walls And death came to life When he called me by name in the presence of the Lord.
so glad to have you all here today. Um, we're Charlie and Ann. We're the Connections Pastors, and we just want to say welcome. Welcome home. Um, you're not here by accident. If you came for baptism, if you don't have a place to go, we would love to have you here. It's a great place to be, a great place to connect. Um, we would love to connect with you. If this is your first time um, to visit us, we'd love for you to pull out a card. There's little cards in front of you and the seat in front of you. If not, just raise your hand and we'll make sure that you get one. And you can just stick those little cards in the little offering bag or bring them to us after service. We'll be at the big desk out in the Grand Hall. And we'd love to meet you anyway. Just see how you got here, connect with you, and um, just say hello. So we have two, just two announcements for you this morning. Um, the first one is there'll be baby dedications next Sunday, the 21st. Um, so if you have a baby you need to get dedicated, come talk to us, us, Stephanie, Ron, uh, Mr. Kevin, just anybody just get hold of one of us. And uh, connection time will be the Sunday after that on the 28th. Um, I believe that's 10, 15 on Sunday morning. So if you want to get connected and meet some people, be there. Yeah, it's the donuts in the cafe, so... <laughs> That's all we have. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Oh my gosh, this had me ugly crying, people. <laughs> ugly crying. I'm sorry for. The, I'm in the background of all the pictures, and I'm so sorry ahead of time. <laughs> anyway, what a wonderful morning, amen. amen. Oh, it's so good to see how good God is, how faithful God is. I promise you, I'm gonna ugly cry again. I promise you. Every one of those that got dipped today, mm, that was someone that's in their past been on their knees before God. And that was a prayer answered today. Amen. 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 We're going to continue our time of worship with our tithes and our offerings. How many of you guys got to hear Pastor Kevin's message last week? I'm sorry, last Wednesday specifically um, on uh, Jacob. And there was a bit in there that God had already started dealing with me on <clears throat> where Jacob um, had an encounter with God and God was like, listen, I know times are tough. I know where your ad's unsure and you're not really sure how this thing's going to end, but I promise you, you have my word. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to protect you and I'm going to see this thing full circle. And Jacob, who was young with his walk with God said, okay, well, I'll make you a deal if, that's, if you do that for me. If, if, if you do that for me, then God, as a, as a, as a token of, of my appreciation, I'm going to give you a tenth of everything you give me. Because he didn't understand the exchange yet. And sometimes we can look at our tithe that way. Okay, God, if you meet all my needs, then at the end of this thing, I'll give you, I'll give you my tenth. Because we're not mature yet. But that the concept of tithing, God was already starting to work on him with. And he must have taught that to his children. That I know that because as I read on in Genesis, we see his son. Joseph, who has been in place in a leadership position um, with the king of Egypt. And the king of Egypt has been told by God, hey, listen, the economy is going to tank. you got seven good years. The economy is going to tank. You need someone to kind of see you through this. So he appoints, he appoints Joseph. He appoints Joseph to be the head of this corporate account for the kingdom. And so Joseph spends the next seven years going and collecting all of this food and all of this grain because he knows the economy is going to hit. And when it hits, he doesn't just need to provide for his household. He needs to provide for a nation. That's what a corporate account does. It provides for nations. Yeah. It provides for regions. It provides for cities, not just for individuals. That's right. Do you hear what I'm saying? So he spends his time. He collects this this grain, this food, economy tanks, and just as he, as he thought, the Egyptians come to him. We need help. We don't have any food. We have some cash, so let me give you my money. I'll give you my money, and you give me, you give me the goods and exchanges. You give me the, the food, and I'll give you my money, because they didn't get a hold of tithing yet. They understand goods and exchanges. Right. So he gives them the food. Years go on like this, and then it gets to the point where they're out of money. And they come to him and they said, listen, I have nothing else to give. All I have is my body. I have myself and I have my land. And what good is either of those things if I, if I die of starvation? Give me some food. And he said, I'm not going to give you food. I'm going to teach you about tithing. 
I'm going to give you seed. I'm going to give you a job. I'm going to give you a job. And when you're going to work that job, and when you work that job, you're going to bring a fifth of what you have, what comes in as a crop, back to Pharaoh. You're going to take a portion of that, and you're going to put it in your savings. You take another portion of that, and you're going to put it in the ground. Because I need you to be forward thinking. I need you to be thinking generationally. Not just feeding the family you got now, but I need you to be thinking about the, the grandchildren you're going to have. That's right, that's right. This is what tithing looks like. Why do you think, and I ask God this, why did you make him take a fifth to Pharaoh? And God said, I needed them to remember where the seed came from. Because here's the thing, that first crop, that seed would be, that, 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 that fifth would be easy because they're going to remember the pressure they were under and the relief that they got from Pharaoh. Now remember, they were coming to Joseph. Joseph was a representative of Pharaoh. Our pastor is a representative of God. So he, they come to the representative, they get the tithe, they bring it to him, because they remember the relief that they got. But he, but, got, but, but Joseph knew, you give them a year, you give them five years, you give them 10, and they're gonna forget how that felt. They're gonna forget that pressure they were under and that relief that they come from. But if I have taught them to always bring their, their first fruits to God, they'll never forget where the seed came from. That's right. That's tithing. That's why you give. Amen. Three ways to give today. One is online giving with the QR code. The second is text giving. You just text 84321. Push, push the numeric uh, number in the message body and press in. And the third is cash or check. Envelopes are in the back of every seat in the house. And you can make checks payable to ECH. This is your time not to tithe to a house, not to give into a person. This is your time to remember where your seed came from. Amen. Amen. Are you ready to give? Dear Heavenly Father, we come humbly to you in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father God, for, for being our source of everything. And we come thankfully into your storehouse and honoring you as our provider. In Jesus' name, amen. Through the 
the, the, the Red Sea. It's the first really depiction of, of natural baptism that we see in the, in, the, in the Bible outside of Genesis chapter 1 when God baptized the, the earth and the waters from heaven, waters from earth, he separated. He did his own baptism with the earth in Genesis chapter 1. But in, in, in Exodus, when G Moses was bringing the children through the Red Sea, he brings them to the brink of the sea. The Bible says that when they step down in the water, obviously that's when the waters parted and they walked across on dry ground. But when they got up on the other side, it says they looked back and their past was following them. And when the past followed them, the past got right in the middle of the water. We looked like dry ground. And then the Lord released that water to come back over top of and cover up all of that junk and all of their past that had been haunting them for 430 years drowned in that Red Sea. So when they come up on the other side, they were able to witness their past, all of the memories, all of the hardships, all of the taskmasters, all of the, the hurts and the pains, they watched it drown and it come up no more. Amen. When Jesus was water baptized, John the Baptist took him down under the water. When Jesus went down, he was a representation of dying. And when he arose from that third, on the, on the, on the water came up, the father said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. He resurrected and the spirit of God descended upon him and remained. Yeah. Amen. When Jesus died on the cross, it's a symbol of death. It's another form of baptism, a death, dying to death. Jesus put a death to death. Amen. Think about it. He put death to death. He nailed it to a tree. Amen. And when he resurrected on that third day, it's life. When a person goes under that water, the Bible says it's the water splits. They're dead into him. They die into Christ. And they will resurrect into him also. So it's not a matter of just seeing your past forgiven. It's a matter of resurrecting into new life. Right? Isn't that good? I feel this in my heart. I don't know who you are today. And I typically don't do this, this type of, type of part of the service. But I just feel, is there anybody in here that has just had enough that's had enough of enough and you're at in a place in your life where you said to yourself today I'm going to church I'm coming to that place today I don't even like those people really but I'm going anyway <laughs> but I'm at a place in my life it doesn't matter what people think I don't care what people are saying I'm not here for anybody else for a show I don't hear if they sing my favorite songs or don't hear my favorite songs if he preaches a good sermon or don't preach a good sermon or if they talk about money too much or don't talk about money I don't care about all that, right? I'm here today because I have to have God in my life. And I've come to the end of myself. And today I'd like to just surrender it all and say, God, I want to make a great exchange. I'll give you my life and my mess if you'll give me your life and the peace that comes with it. If there's anybody in here today that wants to make that exchange right this moment, I want you to raise your hand. You ready to do it? Come on up here. You ready to do it? You ready to pray for them? Or you're, you're, you're celebrating with her, right? Come on up. Come on up. You raise your hand. Come on up here. Anybody else on this side? You ready? Come on up here. Let's do this. We're making an exchange. I'm not talking about maybe getting saved. They may be already saved, right? They probably heard the gospel before. I'm talking about today I'm at the place where I am ready. I'm ready to give it all in exchange for all of my stuff, in exchange for his stuff. Anybody else? Anybody else? Right here? Yeah. Yeah. Come on down. Sing that song one more time. Let's we'll give him a moment to pray. Lord, I confess that I've been a prodigal made for your house but I walk my own roads then Jesus came and tore down my prison 
and death came to life when you called me by name. Scarlet sins had a crimson cost. You nailed my death to that old rugged cross. An empty slate at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was the scarlet sins had a crimson cost. You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross. An empty slate at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was rolled away. Oh. I see bright crimson robes draped over the ashes A wide open tomb where there should be a casket The children are singing and dancing and laughing The Father is welcoming, this is our homecoming Roses in bloom pushed up from the embers Our rivers of tears flow from good times remembered Families are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with the glorious sound. And a great cloud of witnesses all gather round. Because the ones that were lost are finally found. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. The scarlet sins had a crimson cost. You nailed my debt to that old rugged cross. An empty slate at the empty grave. Thank God that stone was rolled away. any pain in your foot if you're having pain in your foot we want to pray with you if you'll just come right around here if that's you pain in your foot come on Mr. Keith come and minister hallelujah chance if you've been up in a fresh expression to hear the story they this is mom and daughter okay and they were estranged for a while right 15 months that they had not kind of had any communication or talked to each other or, and, and just had a, just a schism and the Lord brought them back together and now they're closer now than they've ever been and that good I, I feel led to pray for if you have a schism with a parent, a sibling, I'm going to pray a prayer of, it's, I just brought you the testimony, you overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of your testimony, right? So I'm going to release that, well, we're going to do some work today, I can feel this, this is not going to be church as normal, I can already tell you, we're going to release that, the spirit of reconciliation. Yeah. 
Father, in, in Jesus' name, we release the spirit of reconciliation in families right now. As a testimony of Tish and Nancy, we release that same spirit that brought them together that they didn't know how it would have worked out and they weren't even looking for it to work out. But God, you did it and here they are today driving a long distance to come to hear the word of the Lord and worship you because they're grateful and they're thankful for what you have done. Now we release that same spirit that reconciled them together in the lives of the people that are in here that have schisms in their homes, in their families, whether it be a close-knit family or family that's far away. We're going to bring that together, God. Now we're not going to try to figure out how to do it. We're not going to manipulate the circumstances to make it happen. We're going to rely on the Spirit of God to draw peace and reconciliation to that schism. Thank you, Lord. We bless you in Jesus' name. And everybody in agreement said, amen. Amen. Good. Isn't that good? Let's just keep going. Hey, you know what? We did lose. We, we lost one. And I'm going to say this because I can say if he was here, Dave Johnson passed away Friday night at 1030, okay? Be in prayer for him. And it, it breaks my heart in one regard, but I know him so well that he would get mad at me if I made this a morning time. He is one of those people that says you got to keep moving for God. And he passed away Friday night at 1030. We're going to have his service here. The viewing is going to be 4 to 6 on Tuesday night. And we're going to have a 6 o'clock celebration for him here. So we're, everybody's invited. Dave's right there normally on that front row. Uh, one of the most faithful, if not the most faithful member from the very, very beginning of our church. I've known him. I've married him and Denise. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll present him Tuesday night uh, to be with the Lord throughout all eternity. I'll be in prayer for the family, the kids. Um, you know, it didn't turn out like we were hoping it would turn out, but I have enough relationship with him over all these years. I know him, and I know that he would be, if, if he had the option to come back, he would be telling us, no, I'm not coming back. Amen. All right? But I do expect you to go forward, and that's what he would be telling us. So that's what we're going to do, and we're going to do that in Jesus' name because that's the spirit of the day that was on him and his family. And um, incredible man. Uh, we're going to miss him greatly. Uh, but his, his, his memories and his spirit is impressed upon all of us that know him in our lives. And we'll never be able to shake Dave. Amen. So come Tuesday night, we'll celebrate Dave's going, home going. Um, also, I want to mention to you a couple of things. The first and the last Sunday night of, every, of each month from here to, through, towards the election, to the ele through the election, we're going to get together from 6 to 7 o'clock in the sanctuary and pray for our leaders and pray for direction for the, for the country. Um, so uh, that's the first and the last Sunday nights of the month from, for one hour. We'll just come in here and pray, and um, we're going to pray for some direction uh, for our nation. Amen? Not just our nation, but local, state, federal, all, all of it. Uh, we, 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 the church has got to pray. That's our role is to pray. Um, we're going to pray. I want to mention something else to you, which is a couple of things, actually. Uh, excited. Pastor Ronnie and Brian are celebrating their 17th wedding anniversary today. Isn't that good? I was a part of that wedding 17 years ago. I was in middle school during that time. Uh, <laughs> I had a part of that wedding. Uh, so, but congratulations to them. Uh, it's good. Also, um, we want to congratulate, c congratulate to Kenna Black. Uh, I know Stephanie Black is here, and she's very proud of her daughter. Kenna and her Midland team, Capital Midland team, finished second in the West Virginia Evaluation State Competition. That's livestock farming, land con conservation, all of that. And they finished second in the state, and Kenna finished first for her team in uh, Midland, and she has received a scholarship, uh, a Grassland scholarship, to take, take on to college with her when she goes. Isn't that great? Congratulations to Kenna. She's at our youth over there right now. We'll have to celebrate her again when they come back together the first of the month and, and honor her when she comes back. 
So a lot of good stuff. I want to make one more announcement and presentation to you, and then I'm going to get into, uh, I thought Maria was, did an incredible job on the offering and tithe today, and uh, probably could just let her preach that message, because I'm going to preach that message today, uh, and it's all good. Um, the school, our school is going crazy, all right? It's growing too, but it's going crazy as well. Um, it, it's, it's in a good way, yeah, in a good way. I think we're probably going to enroll another 20 or 25 people in the next two weeks. It's how fast it's growing. Um, obviously, one of the things I've learned about all of growth and um, starting initiatives and doing things, uh, I never look at what other people are doing. We've never done that and go, hey, we need to do that. We're not a copy and paste church. Amen. Okay? Um, we're, it has to come from inside out. We're a DNA church. <laughs> and what that means is it, all of our initiatives, all of our, our startups, all of our, 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 our ministries, everything that comes from has to come from a birthing. And you identify the people that you have in your church and the people that you are, you, you compliment who you are, and then you kind of just let them be what we are. Our church name is Expression Church. That is not a, 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 just a catchy name that looks good on a T-shirt and has a really good logo. That name came from when I was driving to Beckley, preaching a sermon, and the Lord dropped into me when John the Baptist was baptizing Jesus and he walked into the water. The Bible says that the Father said, this is my son whom I'm well pleased. Then he led him into the wilderness to be uh, tempted by the devil for 40 days. He came out of the wilderness and he was released into his everyday life. And the Lord spoke to me and said, that's what we're supposed to do. We're to be, he was to be the expression of his father. Our role on this earth is to be the expression of Christ in everyday real life. Amen. We're not here to build a religion. We're not here to build a denomination. We're not here to make people like us. We're not here to go, hey, everybody be a preacher. Everybody be a teacher. Everybody, No, you have a vocation. You have a specific, unique calling on your life. And our job as a ministry, as a team of leaders, as a culture, is to create an atmosphere and an environment that brings out what God said you are for you to be the expression of Christ in your life. Jesus was identified, he was affirmed, he was equipped, and then he was released in everyday life to be the expression of his Father. Our role is to be the expression of Christ in everyday life, and we do that by identifying, affirming, equipping, and releasing people into their destiny in their life. Amen? So when you look at what the initiatives that we're starting and have started, we're not looking to compete. We don't look at other people and go, hey, we want to compete with, and we don't do that, it's not our, we don't compete with other people, we complete other people, okay? Bro, Jacob and Esau competed, right? Right, we don't, true brothers and fathers and sons complete one another, all right? So when I say that, one of the things that we recognize here at our church is we're very sports driven, right? I just told you last week, I watched 15 minutes of the pillow fight championship. Right? I mean, it doesn't take much. All right? To get us, I mean, if it makes ESPN, it's a good chance I might get a, might get a stop on there. All right? We, have, we are very sports. We're athletic here. At, at, in a, we have, there's a basketball game today with the, the church league that, that, we're, that our team plays on. We play softball league. We do all those things. But in our sports, our school, our school is, is unique. It's not just another private school because we don't think the public school is doing a very good job. It has nothing to do with public school. We're not, we didn't start a school because public school is doing terrible. It's not what we did. My kid goes to public school, all right? I didn't transfer him to our school. He's involved deeply in their athletic program. He's got the school spirit. He's got practice from one to three today, and he's really mad about it because it's Sunday. He's got the full spirit, all right? All right, he's, he said, we got practice today on Sunday. Yeah, that's just the way they work. However, I'll tell you this. We have an incredible group of people that have assembled. And I said a long time ago when we had Coach Bryant here, Larry Bryant has got 50, should I say that out loud, 50 years of education in his, under his belt. 18 private school and 30 plus, 30 public, 20, 20 private now. Um, so he's only 65 years old, uh, 60 years old, something like that. Uh, so he started when he was in middle school too, we were working together doing a, so that's when we start the time clock. Um, so I say all that to say this, the school is doing extremely well and it's growing 
and it's expanding and it's constant movement because of space and all of that. Well, last year we started our basketball program. Stacy Shannon uh, coaches our post-grad. I think 10, or, 10 of those 12 kids have already got uh, scholarships for next year. That means they're paid to play basketball at their next level. Our high school team finished 49th in the state of West Virginia out of 120, I think some 29 teams. That's the first year. We've only had a high school one year. This is our second year of K through eight and we're going with through high school. Well, it's growing and now we've got more kids that are coming and we have got up to a place where we're gonna start this year a middle school football team. We'll have middle school basketball this year, JV basketball, varsity basketball, a national basketball team, and a post-grad team, maybe even more than one post-grad team. But we're, then we're gonna start middle school football. And I wanna, I wanna just introduce to you for a, for a moment if Coach Adam Hill could come up here, Coach Kyle McKnight, and Coach West, if you wanna come too, come on up here. These are, our guys are gonna head up our whole football program. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Sure, Thank you. Appreciate that. So we're excited about what the Lord is doing. That's going to start this fall. There's already, there's already a schedule. They're all the way games because we don't have we don't have a stadium yet. Yet? Oh, did I say yet? But what I'm saying to you is, our school has we have kids that have learning disabilities. There's kids that are, 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 are that are excelling at a high level. The whole idea of our school being a micro school is that it, it gives an individual learning plan for every kid, yeah. right? So no kid is looked at and says, oh, you don't meet our standards. Uh, no, we have a cookie cutter model. No, we look at everybody individually. One of the things that we have here is athletics is a big, it's a pillar, it's one of our foundations. Music is a, one of our, arts and dance is, is a big part of our, uh, 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 we have entre entrepreneurs everywhere. Um, we have trade, people that work in the trade in the blue collar world, that, all of that. So what we're doing is we're letting that school take on that personality. And um, we're excited about what the Lord is doing. And we want you, this is not something you all see us just do. We want, this is the church behind the school, okay? We have the dome that's being built for sports. We got a playground that's gonna be coming in the back for the kids, uh, a playground that's for special needs kids as well. Uh, so there's a lot that's going on. And I just want you to take a moment and then maybe pass it to Kyle. And just, just you got two minutes though, two. Minutes. I'm preaching on Joseph. I better just take 15 seconds. <laughs> we are very proud to, to launch this thing with the church. My family and I have been coming since September. I believe, invited by the Reynolds family, and we are so appreciative to the church and to the Reynolds family and Pastor Kevin and Stephanie and Ronnie um, just for, for bringing us into the church family, and we believe wholeheartedly in the mission of the church, the mission of the school, and that's how we want to build the football program. We want to pour into these kids and focus on their individual development and their walk and try to build our football program in God's image and in God's spirit. So we're just going to be about excellence. We have all, I could talk for three days about football, but I'll pass it down to Kyle. We, I'm trying to build a staff here with our programs that are godly men that are focused on kids and God's working in crazy ways, bringing us together because we haven't talked for 20 years. And I think he was born the last time Kyle and I coached together. He's been to Eastern Kentucky University. I've been all over America, and we're just happy to be a part of this church. Now, he knows I'm an emotional person, so he starts getting emotional inside him, too. So. Well, I've been in this ball game for almost 30 years now, and uh, I was down with the EKU the last couple years, and uh, I just said, you know, I feel like my gift soul has been with high school kids, and I've known Kevin, we played ball against each other, actually. Yeah. He was an Irons and I was a Colgrove. But I just, I called a buddy of mine, I said, I just, I just want to get back to high school kids. Uh, I think there's a lot we can introduce them to Christ, introduce them to football. And so the next thing happened was, uh, he said, well, won't you call Adam Hill? And I said, man, I hadn't talked to Adam in 20 years. I said, I'm going to do that. So I call Adam on the phone, and he goes, hello? Like a Kyle McKnight, he goes, oh my gosh. 
He goes, do I have a job for you? I said, what are you talking about? But uh, so next thing I know, me and my buddy Freddie Hayes, we, they asked us to come to church and we came and got to talk with Pastor Kevin and, and uh, it's just a blessing to be here at this church. You guys have got so much going on. Um, so many lives are being touched and especially our youth and that's what, you know, I was told the kids I coach, I'm not your coach for four years but a lifetime. Yes. And if we can get them introduced to Christ, get them on the right path, then their life is going to be a good life. Yeah. Yeah. I thank you guys for accepting it. Hey, amen. Isn't that good? Hey, before you guys go, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to just stretch your hand, reach your hand this direction, okay? Father, in Jesus' name, we ask you to bless and prosper everything that they put their hand to do that the, kid, the right kids, that the ones you have already picked and, 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 and chosen, and you're ordering their steps to be a part of this program, God, I pray that, that those kids, those kids, whatever obstacles are in the way, have them removed. So that way that the path will be clear and it'll be a red carpet experience for them getting here and they'll be able to be all that they're called to be so we can identify and affirm and equip and release those young men into all the aspects of life that you've called them to be, to be your expression in everyday life. In Jesus' name, amen. Isn't it good? Open house is next Saturday for anybody that wants to bring their kids and do a, be over to the school. What time is it, Adam? 10 o'clock. 10 o'clock. Open house at 10 o'clock at the school for football, and you can take a tour and ask questions and all that kind of stuff. Isn't this good? All right, if you believe in Christian education, you believe that we're doing the right thing, then if God lays it upon your heart to help support it financially, uh, then see me after church or see one of our leaders after church, or you can do the text giving thing again. Uh, but it's going to take a lot of money uh, to, to obviously do this. But the next generation is going to be touched by it. That's what it's all about, right? Isn't it good? It is good. Are you ready for the word? I'll, I promise I'm still going to quit on time. I heard someone say, thank God for that. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Let's go to the New King James, Mike. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures here, and then I'm going to, I'm going to tell you mostly the story. We'll go to a couple of different texts, but this will help us. You ready? But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting for him, for whom all are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing, here we go, many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed, here we go, to call them brethren. How many of you know Jesus being the first fruit, right, in the earth, first fruit of the resurrection, Jesus is your older brother. If you are born again into the kingdom and you have accepted God, Christ as your savior and you have come into the kingdom, G the Bible says we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Jesus, right? We have been brought in through Christ, and he looks at us, and we look at him, and he is our elder brother. Now, this past Wednesday evening, as uh, Pastor Maria was alluding to, I, I, I spoke, and said, I, I think you need to go back and listen to that if you can get a chance to hear that at the mid. I talked about Jacob, and I talked about how jo Joseph and Benjamin came into the picture. Jacob had a wrestling match with God. And Jacob, the word Jacob means uh, supplanter, deceiver. And Jacob was one of those guys that, you know, wrestled his way through and manipulated his way through life. In fact, he got the birthright from his older brother by manipulating with his mom and tricking his dad into blessing him instead of his brother. So Jacob walks away with the blessing. So his life was a life of deception and a life of manipulation. That was jo jo Jacob's his mode of operation. But the problem was that there was a call on Jacob's life because the God had already said through Isaac and through Jacob 
the blessing of the Lord was going to come and the seed of God was going to come to the earth. So there was a call on Jacob that he couldn't do anything about. Jacob couldn't escape it. And once the, the call on your life happens from God, you're not getting away from it no matter how hard you run or how hard you try. It's not going anywhere. You can, you can, you can run and go a whole hundred different ways, different directions, but man, somehow the Lord just finds a way to put you in a, in a box and traps you in there to remind you of what he's called you to do. Jacob found himself in that journey, and on his journey, he found himself in a place where he was running from his brother because his brother was so mad that he had deceived him that Jacob was running from, from, from his brother, and he was headed to a place to, to find a wife, and he was just trying to get away from everybody. And Jacob runs into this, this uh, evening time where he was tired and he was sleeping. And then in, in the 28th chapter of Genesis, you don't have to turn there, but the 28th chapter of Genesis, Jacob finds this place that he wanted to sleep. He was tired. And he put his head on this pillow, but it wasn't a pillow, it was a stone, it was a rock. And as he put his head on this pillow, he had a dream. And the dream was that the ladder came out, and it was a ladder. He saw angels that were going up and down from heaven, coming back to the earth in front of his life. And Jacob wrestled, and he, he thought, what in the world is going on? This is in a dream. And finally, when he woke up, God, right before he woke up, God spoke to him in that dream and said, Jacob, I'm going to be with you. And you're going to go into this land that I have given you. And through you, all the nations of the world, the earth, are going to be blessed. And Jacob's going, my God, I'm in a dream. He wakes up and he says these words. He says, my God, surely God was in this place and I didn't even know it. God was visiting him and he had no clue that God was visiting him. That can happen to you. God could be speaking to you and you go, oh, I didn't know that was the Lord until after the fact, right? Well, that was one part of his journey. Then he, 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 he makes an altar there, makes a sacrifice, and he names the place Bethel. Then what he does is about seven chapters later, he's on his way. He marries through this chapter. He, he goes to his, 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 his place to find a wife. And as he goes to a place to find his wife... Jacob is frustrated because he was supposed to got the good looking one, but he ended up getting the, the one that wasn't very good looking. All right? And he went to this guy named Laban and he says, listen, he had his eye on this lady named Rachel. And he said, she's beautiful. I want that woman. He said, I'll give you that woman if you work for me for seven years. And, Laban, and, and Jacob said, man, I'll work for you for seven years for her. And he worked seven years. But at the end of the seven years, Laban says, I can't give you Rachel. Because she's not my oldest daughter, and the law says you have to take the oldest daughter first. So I'm going to give you Leah. And Jacob looks at Leah and about has a heart attack. <laughs> because she was, the Bible was really nice about it. It says she's fair, fair looking. You know what that, guys, you know what that means. <laughs> All right, you call it what you want. So he, but he has to take her, and then he says, listen, I, but, but Laban looks at him and says, listen, but if you work for me seven more years, I'll give you Rachel. And he went, so <laughs> I, I get Leah, I got Rachel, seven more years. The Bible says he worked seven more years, but it was almost as if it was just a day. Because when you're going after something that you want, right, if you're working from a place as opposed to trying to attain something, so you have two situations, you have two wives. He's got Leah and he's got Rachel. Leah is one that he had to work for and it didn't end up good. And Rachel was one he was blessed and promised with and it almost seemed like only just only a, a, a few days that he worked for it. One was represents the law, Leah, the, and, and Rachel represents grace or the new covenant. You have the old covenant or the new covenant right there under one roof, right? And you got Jacob going, I don't understand this thing, man. I, now I got him. Jacob then starts having kids because Rachel's womb was barren. And Rachel was the one he loved. You following me? So Le Leah comes to him and says, hey, um, we'll, we'll have kids. So he starts having sons with Leah. And then he starts having sons with Leah's concubines and maidservants. And then Rachel comes to him and says, well, you know, maybe God wants me to, you to have sons with me through my concubines. So he starts having kids through his concubine. And I'm thinking to myself, how does Leah and Rachel have that much control over a, right. Jacob stand up, yep. right? Her, Rachel's womb was, but here's the deal. He ended up with 10 sons 
from Leah's group. And he ends up at the end here going, man, I've got to have some sons with Rachel. Because Rachel was the one he loved. So God opens up Rachel's womb. And Jacob ends up having a son by the name of Joseph with Rachel. But the word Joseph, the name Joseph means there'll be another one added. Which tells you this isn't their only son. Are you following me? So Joseph has... Joseph comes into the picture. And Joseph was one that, man, he loved, Jacob loved Joseph because he was from that new relationship, the one he loves, the new covenant, right? He, that, that covenant he had with Rachel wasn't like he had with Leah. Leah was out of obligation, but Rachel was out of pure love. And when they had Joseph out of that pure love, that caused Jacob's heart to turn towards Joseph and favor him. So he made him a coat, and he put the coat on him, and the coat had many colors. And the brothers all knew that dad liked Joseph more than he liked any of us. They had to live in that same home. They had to live in that friction, but knowing that J Joseph was dad's favorite. Then it came a point for them to have another baby, another son. And this was the hardest part for Jacob, because during that time when they were having babies and giving birth, there, was a, there were midwives and nurses that would help bring forth these babies. And in chapter 35, and you don't have to turn there yet either, but in chapter 35, what you have is you have Joseph, a young teenage boy, and now his mom and dad are pregnant with his little brother coming from that new covenant, that new love, that new relationship. Here's the challenge. Rachel was coming to this place in her life and this, 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 this pregnancy was hard. So the, the, the midwife, the nurse that was taking care of this pregnancy looked at her and said, you're going to have this child. And when you have this child, it's not going to be like any other child. And she was, Rachel was concerned because she was at her end. So they're all gathered in the delivery area. And this baby is coming. Joseph now is a young teenager. And the baby's coming, and as the baby's getting ready to come out, the, 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 the midwife is going, you're going, to give baby, you're going to give birth, you're going to give birth. But Rachel was so much in sorrow and so much in pain and so much in, it, it looked like the end, and it was the end. Rachel was on her last day. The mother of Joseph, the wife of Jacob, that one that he loved, the one that he worked for, the one that had his eye on, the one that was a part of the new, their relationship was just centered on love, nothing about works at all. It was all about just how much he loved her, how much she loved him. This baby comes out, and as the baby's coming out of her womb, and it's coming through the canal, Rachel lifts up her head and she says, we're going to name this baby Benoni, Benoni, Benoni. Because his name represents the son of my sorrows. You're going to give birth to the son of my sorrows. And she looks back at Jake, Jacob and Jacob says, oh no, this son is not going to be called Benoni, son of my sorrows. This son is going to be named Benjamin, son of my right hand and power. Right? That name defined everything. One circumstance, one Life-altering circumstance. One looked like it brought forth death, and it did. But one was going to be marked by death and sorrows, or it was going to be marked by power and deliverance and life. Sometimes what we go through in life, it brings forth what looks like and feels like and is death at times. It's ripping your heart out. But if you can see and reach down underneath all of that and recognize that what God sometimes does through that process, what looks like sorrows and heartaches, it actually is something being birthed out of you that you had no idea was even in there. And if you live long enough and walk this thing out long enough, you'll begin to see that during that pain that should have taken you out will be the very pain that takes you in to the purpose and plan of God. Now watch what happens. As they get older, Jacob grows up as a, as a father. Now he's got his two sons. He's got an older son, Joseph, and a younger son, Benjamin. Benjamin's the baby. Joseph's the favorite. He's the oldest son of the, of the, of the love that he had for Rachel, that, that, that wed, wedding that he had from, the marriage that he had from Rachel, the relationship. 
So Joseph grows up and he gets to be about 17 years old. And the other older brothers now from the, on the, the, the Leah side, from the work side, the old covenant side, that are still the religious side. <laughs> Y'all tracking? Yeah. Those people that tell you rules and rules and rules and rules and get yourself together, get yourself together, get yourself together. They see God giving Joseph. They see in Jacob giving jo Joseph blessing and favor and coats. And why? Because he loved him. He, came, he was birthed from a different mother. He came in from a different covenant. And God loved him, or Jacob loved him. And then what happened is the brothers, now we got to get rid of him because he's a threat to us. We can't have that type of, we can't, anything just can't go. They just can't do anything they want to do. They're going to lower our standards, Joseph is. So we got to do something to him. So one day they're out in the field. They got this big cistern, there's a well there. They see the, um, uh, the, the, the Ishmaelites coming, and the Ishmaelites are traveling down here, and the brothers get together and say, we're gonna take him, throw him in that well, throw him in that cistern, we'll strip that coat, our dad's gonna be grieved, we know he is, we're gonna take him, and we're gonna throw him in that cistern, and we're gonna let him die in that cistern. And Judah spe speaks up, and so does Re Reuben, but they, one of the, brother, the older brothers speak up and said, no, we're not gonna kill him, man, we're not gonna do that, but what we'll do is we'll take his coat, We'll kill an animal, we'll put the blood of that animal on that coat, and we'll take that back to dad, and dad will see that he's dead, but it was done by an animal. And the other brother says, well, let's not do, let's not hurt him, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites. So the Ishmaelites take him, and they sell him to, 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 to Joseph to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites take Joseph out of this cistern, and then they buy him, and they travel and take him all the way to Egypt. They were in Canaan, and they leave Canaan and go all the way to Egypt. Y'all following? Amen. All right. I'm going somewhere. So as they get to, to Egypt, Joseph finds favor everywhere he goes. Because the favor when he had on, from Jacob really wasn't just Jacob's favor. It was a favor that came from God. And when God puts favor on your life, I don't care what kind of setting you're in, you're going to get favor. I, you can be thrown in a, in, a, in a people that don't like you. You can be thrown in a cistern and it look bad and still turn into be favor. You can, be thrown in a, you can be thrown in a pit, and it looks like a pit, feel like a pit, sounds like a pit, smells like a pit, but God somehow brings you out of that thing because of the favor of God on you. So everywhere Joseph went in Egypt, he finds favor. He gets favor from Pharaoh, he gets favor from Potiphar, even though he had a few t incidents that were up and down, it, at the end of the day, he ends up second in command of all of Egypt. Now you've got Benjamin living at home, they all know his brother, they think his brother died, Joseph dead, the animals killed him. Jacob's been grieving for years and years and years. Benjamin now is growing up, the older brothers are all there from Leah. So you got them all under the same camp. And now the stage is being set in the world, kind of like it is being set in the world today. The world stage isn't set by men. The world stage is set by God. He uses men. But God's, don't think for one minute, he's not in charge, right? So here we are, you got this, this plot thickening. You've got Benjamin at home with the older brothers that didn't like the, his brother. They think Joseph is dead, but what really is happening in, in Egypt is Joseph has been promoted to second in command. And all of a sudden, God allows a famine to take place in the entire world but as Maria even talked about earlier, before the famine started, Joseph had wisdom and they stockpiled a whole lot of crop and corn and they, 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 they knew the world was gonna go through a famine because the word Lord, God had told him and he had all this stuff and now the whole world is in famine and Canaan's in famine and Jacob looks at his young boy, Benjamin, and he looks at him and he looks back at the older brothers and he says, man, we got a problem here. We, we're gonna die, our livestock's dying, everybody's gonna die. Here's what I need you to do. I need you guys, older brothers, I need you to take this money and I need you to go all the way to Egypt and you need to buy some food and bring it back here so we can survive and live. What they had no idea was what was happening <laughs> was when they were going to, all the way to Egypt and I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn on the last couple chapters here and I'm gonna read it to you in just a second. As they go all the way up to Egypt, they find themselves face to face with their brother that they did not recognize. Joseph now has learned the whole Egyptian way. 
He learned their, their, their language after 20 some years. He knew how to speak like them, dress like them, even though deep down underneath he was a Hebrew boy. He had taken on that persona because he was the second in command and was over everything in the land. He was over it. The brothers go to, Egypt, go to Egypt and they present themselves to him and he said, Joseph recognized them but never told them who he was. They look at him and said, sir, we came here to buy some food. We're in a, our, our dad is in, 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 back in Canaan. He's getting older. He's up in age. Our, our younger brother, brother is, is there. We're, we're, the, we're, we're the 10 sons. We have ten, we're 10 of 12 boys. Our, 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 the 11th son had died, um, was died and killed, and, and told the story as if it really, the same story they told their dad, they told Joseph. What they didn't know, and they were talking to Joseph. So Joseph and them talk, and Joseph, his heart is turning towards these guys. And then he goes to them and he says, guys, here's what I need you to do. I need you to take this, I'll take the money, and, I'll and I'll give you, I'm going to give you all this food, and I need you to take it back to your dad, and take it back to your younger brother, and I need you to feed all your stuff, right? But, but here's what has to happen. Um, I need you to leave one of your brothers here. And they, get to, they got together and said, my God, who are we going to leave? My, we've already lost one brother if we lose another. So they got together and they decided it was going to be Simeon. So Simeon decided to stay while they go back and get, take, the food, get the, take the food back. And they were going to bring more money to get more food. And they're going to start this exchange. Well, here's what happens. Simeon's there. They go back. What Joseph did was take the money that they gave him and stuck it in each one of their sacks. And then when they left, they recognized... We got this money. Then Joseph sends somebody to look for them. And then when he sends somebody to look for them, they come back, they realize they got the, they got the money. They go back to the brother. They go back to, the, to, to uh, Joseph. Joseph says, this is the only way this is going to work this time. The only way you're going to get more stuff from me is you bring your younger brother up here. I, I, we got Simeon, but I, I, want, I want the younger brother. You're going to bring him here. They go back and they talk to the dad. They said, dad... We can get a lot more stuff, but they, they want Benjamin. And he said, man, I can't do it. He said, if, I, if I, I've lost Joseph, this will be my only son that I have left from Rachel. I can't do it. Things got worse. The famine it increased. It intensified. Things got worse. Sometimes, it'll, if, if it's not happening the way God wants it to happen, it looks like it'll get, be it'll get worse before it gets better. It really will. But the promise is it'll get better. Are you all tracking with me? So he goes down to his dad, the brothers go back to the dad, and they say, Dad, we're going to die if we don't get food. And finally, they broke Jacob down. And Jacob said, I'll tell you what, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to let Benjamin go with you. Benjamin is the only son I have left. I've lost one. And now I'm going to lose this one if he comes. Man, if he, if he dies on this journey, I'm done. I want you to know that. I, I won't be able to live. So the brothers are all tormented, and they're going to, we're going to take him. So they take him all the way back up to Joseph. They walk in with the younger brother, and the younger brother walks in. Joseph looks at him. Joseph can't contain himself for all the crying and the tears because he realizes now he's seeing them all. And now the younger brother that was there that he never really got to spend much time with, that's the same younger brother of his mother is in his presence. He looks at them and he says, I tell you what, here's what I, I'm going to do. And turn to chapter 45 of Genesis, in chap chapter 45, verse 1. Let's read this. I hope you got all that story. It's a lot in 20 minutes. For bo then Joseph could not restrain himself before all those who stood by him, and he cried, Make everyone go out from me. So no one stood with him while Joseph made himself known to his brothers. Now watch. He clears out the room. And there's no Egyptians in there. There's no workers in there. There's no servants in there. It's Joseph in his Egyptian garb. And now he's got all 11 brothers in this room. And Joseph wept aloud. And the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard it. Then Joseph said to his brothers... I am Joseph. Does my father still live? But his brothers could not answer him, for they were dismayed in his presence. And Joseph said to his brothers, Please come near to me. So they came near, and then he said, I am, 
I'm going to interchange the word here. I am Jesus, your brother. I am Joseph, your brother. Whom you sold into eat. I am Jesus, your brother, whom you t turned your back on when you were a young boy. When you were running the world and running the streets, when you were doing stuff you shouldn't have been doing and running amok and running wild, you run your back. When you sold, out, sold me out and turned your back, this is Jesus talking to you today. I'm changing Joseph to Jesus and I'm changing the brothers to you. Are you following me? Joseph, your brother whom you sold into Egypt. But now, do not therefore, this is the heart of Christ right here. But now, do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me here to preserve life. For these two years the famine has been in the land and there are still five years to go in which there will be neither plowing or harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and a lord of his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, thus says your son Joseph, God has made me lord of all of Egypt. Come now down to tarry, and do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen and you shall be near to me and your children and your children's children, your flocks and your herds and all that you have. There I will provide for you, lest and your household and all that you have come to poverty, for there are still five years of famine. And behold, your eyes and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see that it is my mouth that speaks to you. So you shall tell my father all of my glory in Egypt and all of that you have seen, and you shall hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell on his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin's wept on his neck. Moreover, he kissed all his brothers and wept over them, and after his brothers talked with them. Now the report of what was heard in Pharaoh's house, saying, Joseph's brothers have come, so it pleased Pharaoh and his servants well. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this, load your animals and depart and go to the land of Canaan. Bring your father and your households and come to me. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt and you will eat the fat of the land. Now you are commanded to do this. Take carts out of the land of Egypt for your little ones and your wives. Bring your father and come. Also do not be concerned about your goods for the best of the land of Egypt is yours. Then the sons of Israel did so and Joseph gave them carts according to the command of Pharaoh and he gave them provisions for the journey. He gave to all of them, to each man, changes of garment. Look at this. But to the younger son, the younger brother, he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of garment. And he sent to his father these things, 10 donkeys loaded with the good things of the Egypt, 10 female donkeys loaded with grain, bread, and food for the father for the journey. So he sent his brothers away, and they departed, and he said to them, see that you do not become troubled along the way. Then they went out of Egypt and came to the land of the father, with their, to the Canaan where their father was. And they told their dad, Joseph is still alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart stood still because he didn't believe him. But when they told him all the words which Joseph has said to them, and when he saw the carts which Joseph had sent to carry him, look at this, the spirit of the father was revived. Now what am I saying? Joseph is Jesus. You and I are Benjamin. We are the younger brother of the elder brother, Jesus. Jesus was sold into slavery by our betrayal of our sin. He was sold into slavery, he was betrayed, he was turned his back on, and the world had turned their back on the Father, right? What we didn't know, but 2,000 years ago, that Jesus, being like Joseph, went to the cross, and when he went to the cross, he paid a dear price just like Joseph paid in that cistern. And he was sent far away. But Jesus said to the disciples, and he said to them, and he's saying to us, where I go, you can't go, but I will bring you unto myself. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Joseph went to Egypt through slavery to prepare a place for him. For who? For all of us, for his brothers. And then Joseph gets in his place of 
the, the, the second in command of all of Egypt, and he looks at his brothers and he turns to his brothers and he says, I know you think you did this. I know you thought you had something to do with me getting here. But really, it wasn't you. What the enemy meant for evil, God turned for good. And then all of a sudden, Benjamin, the younger brother, we're the younger brother. We are the younger brother of Jesus, of the new covenant. Jesus is the Joseph, we are the Benjamins. And the Benjamins are rising up. And here's what you're seeing. You're seeing son of my power, son of my right hand. You're seeing a company of people rise up. And here's, here's what you're seeing all across the country. Don't think you're not seeing this. I promise you, you're seeing this. And if you don't see it yet, you'll see it soon. There are people that have been raised in church, have walked away from God, done with all of that stuff. I don't want anything to do with it. They've been just enough exposed that they've had enough, they don't want anything to do with it. But what you do not know, there is a famine in the spirit that's causing people to come right back to the Lord and go, there's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than this. There's got to be more than this. And then these, see, the brothers come from the old way, and the old way looks at the younger, the, 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 the younger brother and looks at him and says, hey, guys, you're going to have to pay a price. There's a penance you've got to pay. You've got to come in here and get your heart right. You've got to live holy. You've got to give right. And Joseph's going, I don't want to talk about all that. All I want you to do is trade that way for my way. I don't care how you got where you were. We've all come short. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. I'm not looking for, there's a famine in the land spiritually, and I'm bringing you into the kingdom. And Jesus is looking to us going, you don't understand, you're a part of the family. And the world system is laying up these treasures and it's going, to, it's going to be transferred all into the people of God, the ones that understand. Pharaoh looked at them and said, look, I'm going to give you the, don't you worry about your carts. Don't worry about your stuff. I'm going to give you the best of the land. All I need you to do is believe. Joseph said, all I got you to do, all you got to do is believe I'm him. I'm the brother. And it wasn't their responsibility to seek out the brother. It was the responsibility of the brother to reveal himself to them. It's not your job to figure out God. It's God's job to let you figure him out. Joseph didn't say, how about now? Let me say a few things. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll bring back a memory. I'll jar, I'll, let me jar your mind. No, he just said, it's me. It's me. It, Jesus reveals himself like Joseph revealed himself. And the younger brother is all of us. And listen, it's not for the good ones. It's not for the bad ones. It's for all of them. You're going to see it. Mark my words. The famine that you're feeling in the spirit is drawing people in that God has been drawing for years and years and years, and it wasn't their time, but it's their time now. It's their time now. You're gonna see them come back to the Lord, and they're not coming back to join to be a part of the 10 brothers that are of the law of Leah. They're coming in to be a part of Joseph, Rachel, and Jacob. Because the Bible says, you heard it, when the father, when Jacob saw what he saw and heard what he heard, the Bible says when he saw those chariots and those carts coming, the Bible says his heart leaped with revival. The Father of heaven, our Father, his heart is ready to leap with revival when he sees the carts coming for you and me. And they're coming. Israel just got bombed. Right? The United States is trying to tell him now, let's hold off, let's hold up. Listen. Wars are going to happen, right? It might get worse before it gets better, but it is not for destruction of God's people. It is for the redemption of God's people. And I'm going to take it a step further, not just for the redemption of God's people, for the entire world. You're, going to, you're on the threshold of the greatest outpouring of God's spirit the world has ever known. 
Israel stood on television last night and this morning and said, this is the first time in history that somebody has launched, Israel, Iran has launched from their territory and launched the bombs over here. And I'm looking at them going, this is the, I love when they say the first time in history. Because it's the first time in history you're going to see people get saved on the street corner. You're going to see people saved in their car. You're going to, and then they go because somebody's going to say, hey, say, pray for Romans 10, 10, 9, and 10. It's not going to be that way. It's going to be because the Spirit of God is going to move upon them right where they are. And they're going to cry out to God and they're going to get saved. You watch and see. You watch and see. You're going to see the greatest. The harder it looks, the deeper it fights, the, 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 the thicker it sounds and smells, the better it's going to become. Why? It's either son of my sorrows, Benoni, or it's Benjamin, son of my right hand in power. Would you all stand with me? The same event is either son of my sorrows or son of my right hand. And I'm telling you, you can see it as son of my sorrows and what's happening all over the world today. Or you can go, uh-uh, there is Jacob. Somebody's got to stand up and say, this is son of Benjamin. This is Benjamin, the son of my right hand with power. And God is birthing something in the midst of what looks like something is bad. In the midst of it is something great is coming. You're a part of it. He left you alive to be a part of something incredible. So Father, in Jesus' name today, as we walk out of here, we accept the call upon our life. We accept, God, what you're doing. We recognize there's something incredible that's happening in the midst of it all. Yes, Lord, it looks sorrowful. It looks heartache. It looks catastrophe. It looks like things are coming to an end. And we believe all of that stuff, but we know one thing for sure. In the midst of it all, there is a birthing that's coming, a revival that's coming, a revolution that's coming, a redemption that's coming. And God, we're going to see souls coming into your kingdom that we never thought in a million years would come into your kingdom. But God, we're not going to do it. You're going to move upon them, and we're just going to rake them in because of the things that you're doing in the lives of the people. God, you are God. And Jesus is the elder brother, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. And we didn't deserve it, but you made us the younger brother, and we've been adopted into the family to walk this thing out with you. So we walk out of here today with our heads high, knowing, God, that you are King and you are Lord. You are God. There are none other than you. And we say to you today, let God arise and all of your enemies be scattered. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. God bless you all. We'll see you all